Welcome, everyone. Great to see you. Um, welcome to, Thank you. Uh, to Evan, nice to who here. obviously most of you will, will know, uh, BBC Newsnight presenter, top economist uh, and author. And I must say, it's, it's a, uh, after the last couple of days that we've been doing this, this is a bit of a, uh, an oasis, a blessed relief that we can uh, get away from antitrust and talk about bullshit. Excellent. So um, Evan's book, uh, Post-Truth, uh, why we have reached peak bullshit and what we can do about it. Now, um, it's something of a crowded market. I, I, I've seen there's something like <laughs> three, three came out on the same day. At least three books yeah, that came out on yeah. the same day on this subject. There was a bit uh, of bunching, I think, because if you're aware the others are coming out, then you all start trying to come out on the same day. But it's a popular topic. Oxford University, uh, Oxford Dictionary's Word of the Year. Yeah. I actually, slightly differently to the other two, had started work on this one. Um, God knows how long ago. Uh, just because I observed so much bullshit in my day job. <laughs> And, and actually, in economics, there's a, there's a, economists study bullshit. I mean, there's a whole field of information economics. And economists basically work on the assumption that if you, Peter, said something to me that you would say, regardless of whether it was true or not, if you would say that anyway, I would be mad to believe you. So I wouldn't believe you. And so you wouldn't bother saying it. I mean, that is basically what economists call an equilibrium. I won't believe you if, if you'd say it anyway. You won't say it because you won't waste your breath on it. And there will be no bullshit in the world of economic theory. And this is earn people Nobel Prizes, that insight. <laughs> and then we observe there is quite a lot of bullshit. So I actually started out before post-truth uh, and the other books. I started out thinking, why just is there so much of it if the theory says there shouldn't be any? And then you had to rush to get it finished, did you? As well, then uh, it had been sort of moving, progressing a little slowly. And Tim, the very excellent publisher, then said, Evan, this is the time <laughs> to publish a book on bullshit. And you've got to finish it and we've got to get it out. So that was, yeah, it was a. Yeah. So I was a kind of expecting a book about fake news. And there's a bit of, of fake news in yeah. it, but, it, but it's, it's primarily not about fake news. It's about the sort of bullshit in society as right. a whole. So it has application to fake news, but essentially it, it started out and remains primarily a book that is trying to explain why in politics, business and journalism, people are often not entirely straightforward. And why it is believable when they're not entirely straightforward, why we fall or why, why that works. To not, what, so you're trying to explain that. When you get into that, uh, that's the sort of the general theory of bullshit bit. Um, when you get into that, you see that everything that happened in 2016 and Brexit and Trump, and indeed in the last election, Corbyn and May, the way that played out, and other things too, you see that the, the theory kind of explains or has something to do with quite a lot of the new political divide between populism and liberalism. And, and, and that, that, that political schism can be explained in terms of, of some, I mean, just to give you a very quick peek, I mean, I, I think one of the reasons why Trump's and Farage's have been very popular is because the traditional politicians, their communication repertoire has has run out. Their bullshit has faded, basically, and become rather tiresome to many voters. And a Trump comes along, and you know, you can say whatever you like about Trump, but that guy can kind of communicate in, in, in many respects. So you're kind of saying it, it doesn't have to be true to, to, to reveal a wider truth? Well, so, so I, I mean, okay, when we look at why there's so much bullshit, one of the reasons is, is that a lot of stuff that looks like bullshit is deeply informative. And, and it's not about the truth value of the proposition. It's about the underlying message. And, um, and so Trump came along. I'll stick with Trump, because it's, it's, it's a bit further removed from our country. Trump came along and spoke what most people regarded as bullshit. So he would say, Unemployment isn't US isn't five percent; it's forty percent, which is simply untrue. And even a mild modicum of knowledge on the subject would tell you it's not true. And even just anecdotally, it's not true; it's not forty percent. Um, but when he says that, 
he's trying to communicate something a little bit a little bit deeper, which is not about is it true or not. He's trying to say, I'm on the side of the American worker who feels, you know, picked on and doesn't have security in their job. And I worry about blue collar America rather than LGBT rights, which is what Hillary Clinton's banging on about. You know, so all the time Trump's bullshit was designed to signal something about Trump. And in fact, in the book, I talk about him and WrestleMania. If you've seen the YouTube videos of um, Donald Trump, <laughs> his participation in world wrestling entertainment <laughs> and uh, Battle of the Billionaires. And this goes back a bit before he was a politician. Um, now, in a funny sort of way, you might say, you know, there's a the bit where he body slams Vince McMahon and then they fall to the ground and scrap each other. I, I, I don't know, but I'm suspecting there was a bit of theater or stagecraft to that, uh, mm. to that encounter. Uh, but again, you could call it bullshit, but also you could call it quite informative. I don't think Hillary Clinton could have done that, you know, <laughs> and I, I, I it, so you learn something about Trump from his willingness to play that game. So by your bullshit, I, I learned something about you. You, I mean, at the beginning of the book, you talk quite a bit about uh, you sort of define bullshit and different kinds of bull, bull, bullshit and so on. I, you make the point that there, there's a cost to lying. People, people don't want to be called a liar. Um, no. But it's quite clear that some of the things that, bu that, that, that Trump is saying are, are, are demonstrably not true. So, mm. so how has he kind of got away with, with that and not felt the cost of lying? Yeah, so, so, the, so the, the first point is that actual direct lies, for complicated reasons that I'm, I've never quite managed to work out, direct lies carry a disproportionate penalty relative to simply misleading people by being selective with the facts or being economical with the truth or carefully positioning words that will, in the Bill Clinton, I didn't have sexual relations with that woman kind of way, um, were designed to mislead while not actually lying. I think he probably slightly... I mean, actually, I mean, I, I, apologies, but go into a little bit more detail on that yeah, because yeah. it was pretty extraordinary, that uh, the dancing around yeah, and the meaning yeah. of words. On that. So, but your question was, why did, how has Trump got away with so saying you, Or you're declining that, to talk about Clinton and his sexual relations, are you? Oh, no, I, I will oh, talk about that. I'm happy, come I'll back come back to that. But I want to answer your first question, uh, which is, which, which, which is I, I don't know how Trump has got away with it, actually. I don't know. I think if he, had done it, if he did it in court or he did it in a solemn way. Um, and I think the other thing is, I think people, I think Trump supporters, they understand Trump. The quote of the election campaign, almost a cliche now, is the press took him literally but not seriously, and the supporters took him seriously but not literally. And so you kind of know what you get with Trump. You know, he stood up at that press conference and said, I had the biggest electoral college vote of any president since Reagan. And then the CNN guy got up and said, well, actually, Obama got a bigger one than you. <laughs> and he says, well, I meant a Republican. And he says, and George Bush, the second, got a bigger one than you. And he says, well, is, I was told different. I was told different. I didn't know. Is that right? But I had a great big victory, didn't I? Do you agree? I had a big victory. <laughs> and so he's so blasé, and you kind of, you would never really, you would never really kind of act on a sort of a Trumpism, would you? You'd, 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 you, you sort of know you have to check, check the facts after. So... I think in a way it's because he's so blasé with facts that he gets away with it because no one is any way misled. Yeah. That's the... Clinton. Clinton. <laughs> well, so Clinton's just a great example of bullshit and, and the distinction between lying and bullshit. I mean, bullshit is a whole lot of things, but Clinton's was, I didn't have sexual relations with that woman. The people who had interviewed him about this had defined sexual relations I can't remember what the, the, the formal definition was, but it was contact between any genital part and another part of the blah, blah, blah. Um, and, and so they defined it because they knew Clinton might wriggle out. Yeah. And but it, he, again, this is not really safe for work, is it? But he, 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 kind, of, he kind of argued that, that she was having sexual yeah. relations with him. Yeah, but he, he didn't have sexual, sexual relations with her. <laughs> by the strict, by the strict, strict definition. literal definition of the words that they had. And he said, well, I just went by your definition, and uh, I, I did wonder, you know, as, as, as though he was just doing his best to be helpful. Um, but, I mean, we know, we know 
he wasn't. But bullshit comes in a lot of other forms, though, Peter. I mean, because I, I, I think you've got that, which is very carefully attuned to the facts, you know. Clinton knew what the facts were and was carefully dancing around them. You've got spin, which is what you do all the time, which is kind of um, <laughs> trying. You're never going to lie, but you're going to interpret the facts in a generous way uh, to yourself. And then you've got a whole lot of sort of afactual forms of bullshit, which is, which is, um, it's just not about whether it's true or not. It's just about attention grabbing, or it's about uh, gibberish. I mean, I quote a wine review in there. I, I mean, literally. I googled wine review. The first thing that came up was a wine review. <laughs> and I just read it. And I, it was just such gibberish. I thought, that is a fantastic example. It's not, it's not that it's true or false. It's, it's, and it's, it's even, it's, it has a purpose. You know, she's, she obviously knows about wine. Um, but could she really detect those seven flavors? I mean, you know, I don't believe she could detect all of those simultaneously and, and say they were in sync. And it's a juicy wine with a personality, a structured personality. You know, do we really think, you know, wine? Yeah, but, 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 but it, was trying to, it was trying to tell you something. And, and, you, and you, make, you mentioned the uh, uh, advertising. So uh, adver largely advertising is, is bullshit, and you don't believe the things that, yeah. that, that happen in advertising. But they are, they are nevertheless sen sending right, you so an important message. Right, so all this message. comes back to a lot of the time, the bullshit you observe has an underlying message. Um, and yeah, so, th so that wine review, is telling you, A, she liked the wine. It was quite a long way of saying that. B, it was a pleasure to read. And C, it told you she knew about wine because she knew what words to throw into the gibberish of a wine review. But the, yeah, advertising is a very interesting one because economists have had a bit to say about this. So if someone says, buy my product, it's the best product in the world, you'd be foolish, really, to believe them because they'd probably say that anyway. If they spend 20 million pounds telling you, buy my product, it's the best product in the world, should you believe them now? Now, at one level, you shouldn't, because 20 million pounds makes no difference to the likelihood that they want you to believe what they're saying. However, if they spend 20 million pounds telling you to buy their product, it tells you something about how much belief they have in their product, because they wouldn't spend 20 million pounds on this if they thought it was just fly by night, here today, gone tomorrow. And so they're spending 20 million pounds because they think this product is good. And they may not even understand that. And you may not understand why you respond to advertising. But there's a sort of, there is an underlying message there that is carried by the lavishness of the ad that says, this is a product, you know, which is we're investing in. And that's an important message. And if that means spending, hiring Catherine Zeta-Jones to advertise your mobile phone service, that is better than hiring a other, you know, beautiful woman to market your mobile phone service. Because the fact that you've hired Catherine Zeta-Jones says, we really like this, this product. We're here and investing in it. And, and it's important as a consumer that you know that they buy, that they like their product. So a lot of advertising, I think, can be explained, explained that way. Let's talk a little bit about the, 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 the recent election campaign. So in a pretty extraordinary, historically extraordinary campaign, and you saw Theresa May not doing well by very much sticking to, to, to sound bites. Um, and then Jeremy Corbyn apparently being extremely authentic. Right. So uh, where was the bullshit? there well <clears throat> in in some ways you could you could write up the uk election campaign as similar to the us one that you had an outsider politician who had commanded a style that was just more authentic less media savvy more kind of saying what what he thinks against a traditional politician with the controlled messaging of the sort of traditional political communication industry and, and, you know, in the kind of battle of communication styles, each, by the way, has their own bullshit in them and each has their own kind of, their own style and their own artifice and their own promises. Some may or may not be sustainable or deliverable, but they each have their own elements of kind of fantasy about them. 
And in the battle of those styles, the old style political bullshit was defeated. I mean, it, 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 she won the election, but no one would say she won the campaign. And personally, I think that was, you know, the last time that kind of controlled messaging can be deployed on anything like that of scale and, and, expect, and expect to win. It's just worn out. And these things will come and go. You know, there will be a period of the new style outsider authenticity, and I'm sure that will grow wearisome, and uh, people will move on to something else. But I definitely think the kind of, the sort of the spin and control that one would say started with New Labour post-92, it kind of peaked and it started diminishing, and, 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 and Theresa May's campaign was the sort of last... So, I mean, you last, talk about, about peak bullshit. I mean, it, it, where did peak bullshit happen? Did, did it happen in the Brexit vote, or the <laughs> Trump election? I mean, d does, does Corbyn represent the, the, the falling of, of the line uh, in terms of bullshit? Would, would you be optimistic well, about that? Yeah, so I, I, I was thinking of peak bullshit back in 2013. Uh, and then 2016 came along, and you realize <laughs> that, the, that these peaks are like climbing hills. There's always another one just beyond when you get to the top. Um, no, I mean, I think we're in an era. This is, this is one of the key points of the book. I think we're in an era in which politics is divided. Societies are feeling discombobulated by change, cultural change, cultural and economic change. There's a discontent around, and truth has come. For this period of our politics, has come to matter a bit less than it sometimes does. So in the election campaign, there was less scrutiny in this campaign about whether the plans added up or were sensible or made, you know, were affordable. There was less of that. The campaign was more viscerally about whose side are you on, insiders, outsiders, liberals, populists, um, globalists or, or nationalists. These divides have taken over. And with those divides being very fearsomely felt, a lot of people, when, they, when a proposition pops out of public discourse to hit them, we send 350 million a week to the EU, people are thinking not, is this true? Does it matter if it's true? What is the evidence? Who says this? What interest do they have in saying this? People are not appraising it in that way. They're looking at it and saying, does my team believe this? Is this what my side is? Uh, is it, and, and belief in propositions, for the moment, in our divided times, is more about a kind of tribal belonging than about evidence appraisal. And, and so, yes, I think we are at a high in terms of bullshit. And I think we're at a high in terms of people being willing to just sort of swallow stuff or like it on Facebook and share it and regurgitate it because our critical faculties have been overcome by our kind of tribal allegiances. And I, I don't know about you, I mean, I, I see it with my friends on Facebook who by and large are a kind of more metropolitan than, than, than a typical bunch. And I, I, I mean, I just see them liking stuff because it's not because it's, they've thought about it but, or the, because they're open-minded but because it makes them feel good. To, uh, sort of it's gratifying to like something which your friend likes and which is affirming them all in this kind of... Yeah, and what we saw after Brexit bubble. in particular is that you know, people horrified by the Brexit vote, so they shouted louder yeah. about why uh, outvoters had voted that way. Well, Counterproductive, you would say. <clears throat> well, you see, I, th I think if you believe all of that, I think that, that, that one of the... How to respond to this phase we're in. I mean, look, bullshit's always been with us, so I don't want to exaggerate the point that, that we're in an era of bullshit. But I do think we are in an era of somewhat more of it in public discourse. And if you want to, if you want to deal with that, I mean, you know, some people say, well, you need arbiters, you need the Advertising Standards Authority to monitor advertising, and you need a kind of the Statistics Authority to monitor statistics. And you need a bit of that. I'm not against that. But I think it's less about arbiters of what is true and what is false. It's much more about getting people to put evidence and truth and reliability back up their priority list. And to make people worry more about truth, you need for them to worry less 
about their tribe's status and their tribe's position. And if you, if you were a bunch of, 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 of Brexiteers, unlikely, and I was a Remainer and I was trying to persuade you you were wrong, shouting that you're a bunch of dimwit idiots who didn't know what you were doing and you were gulled by 350 million, uh, and don't you understand what the economists have been saying about how bad it'll be, that is not going to persuade you any more than trying to have an argument about facts with a 9-11 conspiracy theorist will, will persuade them. It won't persuade them. So the way to persuade you is to reduce your sense of tribal allegiance to your side. And the way to reduce your sense of tribal allegiance is to offer you more respect, to listen harder, and to have a more gentle conversation, and not to not just to shout at you about the facts and the proof that you're wrong, because that really entrenches positions. If any of you have dogs, that sometimes you tug the dog on the lead to get it to come your way, and sometimes that makes the dog want to go that way even more. And I think there's been a lot of that, particularly on the Remainer side, of sort of shouting at the Brexiteers, um, it's shouting about how stupid they are. Uh, and I don't think that's a very good way of of persuading people that, 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 that they're wrong and, uh, and, and probably counterproductive. And that kind of feeds into your philosophy of, of interviewing. And obviously, people make the contrast between you and, and Jeremy Paxman. And you saw the Jeremy Paxman <laughs> style in the election uh, debate. Um, your, your attitude is to, is to draw people, draw things out of people rather than be combative. Yeah, I mean, I don't think there's a right or wrong interviewing style. And, and, and one or two newspapers have always tried to set it up as me against Paxman style. I'm, I, and I, I, I mean, Paxman is a god and a, you know, a giant among interviewers. And I, I, I'm a pygmy c compared to him. So that's not, that's not it at all. Um, I think that there has been a problem of everybody trying to be a Paxman, which has had the effect, if you get too many Paxmans, it has the effect, and has had the effect, of training our political class in particular to kind of obfuscate rather than say anything. So it, it sort of works up to a point, and then you just train the politician to be boring, and the conversation just ends up in a kind of a, score, uh, a no score drawer in them basically just scrapping on the, on the floor. So I think, I think there are, we do need, we do need other sort of interview style, styles to be available. Paxman and Humphreys, absolutely the best at that sort of adversarial approach. I've, I've certainly thought you need to notch the dial um, away from that. And I, it's, it's not that I've taken a particularly intellectual approach thinking it through, it's more I just am incapable of doing what Paxman does, I'm just too <laughs> empathetic. But I, I think it is a da there is a danger to, to, to not being a Paxman, which is it, 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 there is a risk of it just being a bit boring. Mm -hmm. and, and the absolute worst risk of it is, I mean, at the very least, if the politician closes up and Paxman is haranguing them, you can enjoy watching Paxman harangue them. So at least half the conversation is interesting. Is yeah. um, if the population doesn't, if the politician doesn't open up and are still boring, and I'm, if I'm nice to them and they're still boring, then you just end up with a very boring conversation because you haven't even got me being funny and pulling sort of faces <laughs> at them. And uh, it's just not as entertaining as Paxman getting nothing out of them if I'm getting nothing out of them. So. Uh, so there is, there is a definite problem, but I, 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 I you know, I mean, I, I don't know what you do about it. I, th I think you just have to sort of keep exploring things. You have to be a little bit unpredictable, and you have to hope that people will occasionally be a bit more revealing in an interview if you're giving them a little bit more rope, really. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But as I say, no, there's no right, there's no right style, mm -hmm. no right or wrong style. Now, I was quite surprised that in the, in the index to the book, there's no mention of either Google or Facebook, which I was kind of expecting. Um, and uh, you don't c cover hugely fake, fake news, no. but in, in terms of kind of peak fake news, do you, th do you think we have reached peak fake news? And, well, and, and actually, I, I wonder, is the emphasis that has been placed on fake, fake news in recent months, is it in proportion to the scale of the problem in this <clears> country? 
Well, uh, I've got a slightly sort of odd perspective on this. I, I, I think it's, to be honest, I think probably some of the talk is a bit overdone. The reason I think it's overdone is that people, I think you ultimately, the most important thing is that the truth is out there and that it is fairly easy to navigate your way to the truth. And if people are not navigating their way to the truth, they're believing stupid lies, despite easily available evidence to the contrary. You know, I, I tend not to think, well, that's Google to blame, or we need a kind of a big sensor to come down and block the lies. I tend to think we need to ask, why are people believing nonsense when truth is available? So that, that's my sort of take. So the first thing I think you, know, you guys have to ask is, is, is the truth available? And if you are auto-directing me towards nonsense, um, I think that's a bit irritating because I think you don't want people to be auto-directed to nonsense because that's making the truth less available rather than more available. So your first question has to be, is the truth available and is it easy to navigate your way to it? And that's, that's where I think your responsibility, that's where I would tend to say, I don't feel strongly about any of this actually, but I would tend to think that's your responsibility. Um, if people choose not to navigate their way to the truth because they would rather believe in, in fairies or in, um, in, in, in Holocaust conspiracy theories or 9-11 conspiracy theories, um, if, if they'd rather believe that kind of nonsense I think that's a sort of bigger problem. That's sort of above above your pay grade. But you really. wouldn't you wouldn't intervene to stop people claiming. Right, I would intervene on certain things, Peter. I mean, I think I I don't want it to be easily. I don't want, you know, pictures of child abuse to be available and 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 and, and searchable. I don't want bomb making techniques to be to be easily available. So I think there are areas where you're going to close it down, basically. But I think those are pretty few and far between. My own, my own sort of instinctive view is that it's much more important that the truth is available and easily available and is your kind of navigable and uh, easy, easily navigable to those who want it. You see, I, I mean, in a sort of funny sort of way, if there are people believing batshit crazy stuff about 9-11, as someone who doesn't believe that, I kind of want to know that there are some people who believe that. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. That's the sort of useful thing for me to know. So I don't want, there's a sort of fine balance between over-suppressing it and under-suppressing it. And I, 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 I mean, I, I have, and the book is, optimistic about human nature. Most people, most of the time, in the long term, gravitate towards things that are true rather than that are false. So I, I feel sort of optimistic that by and large you know, the truth does emerge. And, and so I'm, I'm less, I suppose, just instinctively a bit less keen on trying to control the public discourse away from sort of stupid, stupid things. I worry more about, and that, the, the only other thing I'd say is I do think kids should be taught at school what the difference between a reliable and an unreliable source yeah. is. And so I think a little bit of critical, critical thinking at school important. would be useful. Yeah. And, and you can help with that. Great. Okay, let, let's go to some questions from the audience. There's a microphone there in the middle. If anyone would like to queue up for it, uh, and, and do, do ask I'll... about anything. I mean, if you can, you can complain about the BBC, or I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm here <laughs> available till five to two. So uh, that's normally what happens anyway. But uh... hello, hello. Yes. Uh, thank you for joining us today. My question is: uh, journalism has largely operated with a principle that facts are facts, and you have to report them. Um, in an era in, of post-truth where a, pres, a, a person can get elected president ignoring largely the facts, um, how can you, journalists, hold them accountable uh, in, within that new framework? Right. OK, so two things. Good question. How do we hold people who are fast and loose with the facts, how do we hold them accountable? Look, just number one. Don't overstate the importance of facts. I mean, there are facts, and I'm not a kind of you know, relativist who thinks nothing is actually objectively true. There are facts. But most 
the vast bulk of our disagreements in society are not so much about the facts. They're about the weight we put on different facts. And so the Brexit debate, the 350 million was a contested fact, and it was uh, uh, not true. But the reality was it was 280 million. And 280 million, 350 million, I think to most people it still feels like a lot of money. And so I don't think the difference between 350 and 280 explains the, 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 the outcome. So look, I just think don't over obsess on facts. Most of it is about judgments. And the judgment in that referendum was the economists say it will be bad to leave, or the vast bulk of them say it will be bad to leave. But it's not a fact that it will be bad to leave the EU, bad for the economy. It's, it's a judgment. And people are entitled to say, we hate economists, we don't trust them. So first thing is, it's not about facts most of the time. Sometimes, but not most. Secondly, how do we hold people to account when they are lying about the facts or fast and loose with the facts? I think we just present the facts in a gentle and uncritical way. I mean, is, they've said it was 350 million. It's actually 280 million. That's all you have to do. If people don't want to listen, then you need to ask, why will people choose to believe the lie rather than believe the truth? And, 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 and that's a different problem. So all we can do is gently and as patiently and objectively as possible present the facts as we understand them. Now, there is one complication which I want to give you, which the 350 million fact, which is very unusual that there's a sort of a fact which is at such corner, you know, the center of such a dispute. Is the one thing I think the media has difficulty with, and this proved, is that when a campaign throws out a lie, knowing it's a lie, in order to get us to report it's a lie, in order to draw attention to it and give weight to their side of the argument, I don't know what we do. And you, th you think they did that? Well, there were some formulations where they, they, th th they were kind of more accurate, and there were some where they clearly weren't. And Dominic Cummings, who ran the Leave campaign, has, I think, used the phrase designed to provoke discussion or something like that. And I think if you're in a campaign and you know the argument could be about business and jobs, could be about the money we send to Brussels, or could be about immigration. You might want it to be about the money we send to Brussels. How on earth do you get it to be on that terrain? Well, maybe the way you get it to be on that terrain is to throw out a lie, and then we'll spend the next week arguing about, is it 350, 280, or 150? And then we've kind of done their job for them. In the, the act of debunking what they say, we've done the job for them. And I, I think that's something we need to think about. I think that's, that's a sort of tricky one, because our normal rules would be we have to report what the campaigns say. If one campaign lies, we have to say, by the way, it's not true. That's, we're not impartial between lies and truth. We, we can say that's not true. We should report it's not true. But we can end up giving it undue, undue prominence. And we now have the, the, the American newspaper's policies on yeah. reporting Trump yeah. tweets, yeah. for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Theo? Um, is political journalism failing in Britain? And just to give you some how I think about this, you know, the election we saw this traditional um, way of reporting politics, which I subscribe to the Today program, Newsnight, the kind of reasonable and respectful. And then you have this kind of non-traditional online, we are as media, uh, you know, all of these kind of news sites, Paul Mason kind of launching diatribes, and the idea that the institutions that do the reporting are in themselves inherently biased. And when you look at um, the, the side that I am sympathetic to, the kind of traditional respectful media, um, you know, in 2015 it told us that uh, there would be a hung parliament, and there was an outright majority. <laughs> and then this time they told us that there would be... An outright majority, majority and there was a hung parliament. parliament. And then you, know, you look at the kind of the people that I think are the nutters online, they were right, and now, kind of, which one is nonsense and which one is the truth? Well, I think, you know, I think one of the things, and this is, th this is really important, is you mustn't think that there is some objective fount of knowledge which is known to somebody or 
we just have to find the person who has that fount of knowledge. And if we can just find the right person, then we'll, everything will be clear. It's just not like that. Public discourse is a discovery process. But it's a discovery process in which the thing you're discovering is moving all the time. And so rather than thinking, oh, is there some systemic flaw in the mainstream media? I, I would tend to say, crap, we get it wrong quite a lot, don't we? And, and, and this was one of those ones. And the last one was because the rules seem to have changed quite a bit. It's not, by the way, just the mainstream media. I mean, mainstream media didn't just make it up. They looked at the local election results, which were entirely in accord with everything the ma mainstream media was saying throughout the election campaign. The, it wasn't evidence-free what the mainstream media said. So yes, I mean, the outsiders did much better than everybody said they would. Rather than thinking, you know, what rubbish messengers, you just think, well, something big is going on. Something big is going on, and the kind of tools which we've had are aren't working very well. Uniform swing models of, 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 of seat projections, which were the thing that was mm. driving a lot of these projections. Rubbish, you know, they just didn't work this time. And um, so, so I, I think that I, my, th my, my view is, is that it's a mess, but life is a mess. And we're going to reflect that messiness sometimes. And I like the fact that you can read the Canary or Breitbart and take different views on these things. I like the fact that they're sniping at us. Personally, I wouldn't recommend you go to the Canary or Breitbart for a kind of an effort to see the other side of the argument. I think we will make some effort to present both sides of an argument. I don't think they will. I think they will not do that as well as we do. But we don't always do it well, but we'll, we'll, we'll make an effort to present both sides of an argument. And so I, I just want there to be a mixed ecosystem. I want there to be people shouting at the sidelines. I want there to be people who are offensive and people who are funny and people who exaggerate and people who give vent to frustration and anger. And I want there to be kind of the New York Times and the BBCs of the world who'll make some effort in their own flawed way to sort of be fair to everybody. And I don't want the BBC to be a monopoly of that. I want there to be Sky News and ITV News and others who are making a kind of a similar effort to just sort of be fair and to, to be measured. And I want everybody to know what they get when they buy those things. I want people who know when they go to the Canary or Breitbart that they're getting something that is, you know, probably skewed from a particular perspective. And I, I hope that they won't think that is the ultimate truth. And I hope they will come to other areas other, other media to, to see the other side of an argument. But it's a mess. And we're not perfect. There isn't some, there isn't some innate truth. It's a, it's a process of discovery. And if, as soon as you think about it as a process of discovery, you, 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 you kind of stop looking for the fount of all wisdom and then say, oh, these people are rubbish. They got it wrong twice. I mean, we get it wrong all the time. We just, but we're discovering it along with the rest of you. you know? Is the BBC's center of gravity in, in the right place, would, would you say? I mean, you, you often get attacked from both sides. We get but... attacked from both sides. Um, I mean, look, I, I think it is sort of in the right place. I think we nudge towards the opinions of experts away from mass opinion to some extent. Uh, and I think it's appropriate for us to do so. But I think the main thing about the BBC is its heart is in the right place. Most people at the BBC, whatever their views, will understand that, that we have to be fair to both sides of an argument. That doesn't mean we have to say, on the one hand, the earth is flat, on the other hand, it's round. We, but we do have to sort of be fair to the evidence that each side, each side puts up. And it, it, I mean, it'd be, to me, it'd be terrible, both for personal reasons, because I'll lose my job, and for, social, for society, if the BBC is kind of deemed to be unfit. Um, because I think we do want, you do want people who see their job as being fair to both sides, as you want, also want people who don't see their job as being fair, who see their job as being unfair to the other side. I like adversarial journalism, but I don't want it to be the only kind of journalism. And so, no, I don't think, in answer to your question, that traditional political reporting is dead. I think it's been a particularly fascinating time in which we've got a lot wrong. And 
that is that is that's life's experience and that's that's fine i mean we need, just need to keep working with getting it right next question hi thanks for coming um so how much do you think the rise of bullshit is due to um basically the lack of good ideas or lack of solutions from a policy point of view so politicians have to increase bullshit because they can't differentiate themselves i mean the, the two parties in the uk have basically become very centralized than they were in the 70s uh, and on the on the business side of things so in areas where they don't have innovation you see a lot of bullshit. I used to work for unilever a uh, difficult place to innovate and you compare apple when the iphone came out they didn't say anything they just had a, a, an iphone and google with search so how much do you think it's that's such an interesting question that's a really <laughs> really good question and so at some big level, my sort of stock answer to that would be, I think a lot of what we're talking about comes back to the financial crash of 2008. The crash has given us a decade of stagnation and no rising incomes. And that stagnation has given us a period in which bullshit has held a bit more sway. When, all, when everybody's getting richer and everybody's feeling we're on a trajectory of improvement, there's less to sort of fight over. And it's less tribalistic, incidentally. And I worry less about my relative status, because we're all getting better. When the going gets tough and there's no, there's no you know, general increase in living standards, it feels much more like a sort of visceral fight for, for relative status. And then I'm going to become tribal. I'm going to believe the crap that my side believes, and just because my side believes it. And so I. I think, in that sense, your point is right. Now, the other, but the, you, you take the question further. It's a really good example. When the iPhone comes out, they don't need bullshit because it just sells itself. And as the improvements get much more and more incremental, the bullshit t notches up a dial mm -hmm. to try and pretend, pretend otherwise. I mean, that, that's the sort of grand, I haven't even thought of that, but I think it's a really interesting, really interesting theory. I would slightly disagree with your premise, because to me, it doesn't feel like at the moment we're in, a, in an era of low innovation. I mean, you'll know more than this than I do, but I, it still feels to me like- Policy we're, points of view. Policy government point of view. Not in. Yeah, good government's not, not, not knowing what to do. Possibly. I mean, it's definitely the center ground in politics hasn't had a good period since 2008, when they haven't really had an idea. They haven't had a response. You know, the populist right has had a response, a sort of nationalist response to the crash. The populist left has always had a response and said the crash would always happen. So they've been, to that extent, vindicated, and I think feel empowered by it. Um, and the kind of Blairite middle, middle of the road have, have struggled, because they, the, 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 they haven't really had a response to the crash. And, and, and Macron is the best kind of example of someone coming up with perhaps having one in France. But we don't really know whether he's going to deliver or not. Um, and you're right. I mean, maybe that has led to some of the bullshit we see. So do you remember the Labour leadership contest the, where, where Corbyn won? So this is 20, September 2015. It was definitely the case that if you were a casual observer, you would say the only one who had anything to say out of the four standing was Jeremy Corbyn. And, and the others were kind of flannel, they were, they were flanneling because they didn't have enough, enough kind of substance to articulate a, a, new, a new vision. So in comes Corbyn with that vision. And I, and I do think I do think that is a problem for the center ground in politics at the moment. They're, they're, they're a bit bereft of, of, of stuff to say. Um, and that's, you know, that's why at the moment the choice is really not one in which the center is very strong. It feels as, you know, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn is, is kind of, there's a missing piece in the middle. Tim Farron, I suppose. <laughs> Now we're quite quite close on time, so let's, should we take three quick questions and, and then uh, Evan can wrap them up? Cool, thanks. Uh, thanks very much for coming in. I found it absolutely fascinating, especially the sort of idea around um, persuasion uh, not being necessarily about being right, but about uh, sort of reducing barriers between tribes, I guess. Mm. And as a 
fact wielding Ramona. Um, I can see how that sort of applies to both political parties, but also at an individual level, Absolutely. having arguments with people. Yeah. <laughs> and I wondered if you have any sort of good examples of that, maybe recently or, or at a personal level that you could share. Right, quick answer, no, I don't. But I do know at a personal level, I do know that every argument I ever have is helped and your case is strengthened when you show enormous respect to the other person. It's incredible. I mean, it's incredible how obvious that is when you do it and how few people seem to understand it. And, um, and, and trying to work out what's really motivating them, which is normally something about status. You know, it's like the sort of family argument where you have an argument about where the kettle goes or something, and then you say, this is really about your mother, isn't it? And it's, it's sort of, if, you, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if you can get to that without hostility, you, 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 you do, it, it just, it, it, it is much better. I, I, yeah, I've, I've got builders in at the moment, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to have an argument with them every day. And I do think it works better when, I, when I'm really nice to them, except what well, occasion you have to get cross to show it really matters to you, but, um, but, but better to be nice. Kitty? Hi, just really quick, and thanks again for coming in. Very interesting. Um, as well as enjoying bullshit and responding to that at the moment, we also seem to be really celebrating losers. So thinking about Nicola Sturgeon after the Scottish referendum and the Jeremy Corbyn fever at Glastonbury, which is obviously a certain type of bubble, but why, why do we love a loser post the election? Why aren't we doing that before the election and shaping the result? Um, I, th I think it's actually just trajectory matters much more than you're suggesting. So although Jeremy Corbyn won, his trajectory was up. So it felt like he was the winner. And Theresa May's trajectory was down, so she felt like the loser. And momentum matters enormously because human beings are sort of evolved to always extrapolate the current trajectory. So sort of in our minds, the fact that he did better than expected is a kind of a winning pitch. And it has been difficult sometimes not to say, he, you know, he won the election, even though he obviously lost the election to Theresa May. And so it's, it's, I think it's about trajectory that rather than loving losers. There are people who love underdogs. Um, but it didn't really sort of work for, for, for the Lib Dems, did it? Or, or, or even UKIP, who were a long way behind. So, yeah. In fact, bandwagon effects. We like winners. We like winners. Actually, we, 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 you know, the thing that all parties want to do is to pretend they're winning so that we, they all lie and say, oh, our private polling says we're on, we're on to a thing here. You, we're the winners. You know, join the bandwagon. You don't want to be left out. You know, so so it's, I, 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 I probably don't agree with your premise, but it's a good question. <laughs> Elijah, last question. Last one. Um, I'm on the PR team, so my question is a little bit selfish. Um, mm. When it comes to Google, we're faced with a lot of bullshit externally, and it seems like we have done pretty much everything you've suggested, so we've been nice, we've been respectful in different sit uh, situations. So my selfish question to you is, how can Google withstand and maybe even ride the, the tide of bullshit? <laughs> right. So I think it's uh, carry on as, as you are. It would have been much worse if you hadn't been nice, respectful and all those things. So that's one. And secondly, just to hold in your head. This was something that was said to me by Warren Buffett. I interviewed him for B the BBC. He's one of the best interviewers ever, interviewees I've ever had. He was in his office in Nebraska. He let us wander around with a camera, just filming stuff while he was in his office. He didn't have any PR in tow. He didn't require any questions in advance. He didn't set a time limit. He was absolutely wonderful. And he gave fairly frank answers to the questions. And I said to him afterwards, why don't you have a PR when probably a mid-manager in a large company would come with two PRs to an interview like that? And he said, well, by the time you die, you'll have the reputation you deserve. And so really, there's no point in thinking about the PR too hard. Mm -hmm. Just <laughs> behave as you want to be. And, and I'm afraid I really, do, I really do believe that. And so there's a lag. There's a lag. Uh, you know, but if, 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 you, if you are nice, the public will regard you as nice eventually. That is the, I would work on that rule. Just as if your company is worth a lot, your share price will reflect that 
eventually, which is, by the way, how Warren Buffett made money, and it's the same principle. You, there's no way, there's no way, I'm afraid, of spinning a bad thing and making it look good. And this has been the mistake of the PR industry. PR isn't about trying to make the company look good. It's not trying to make a rat look like a, a cuddly squirrel. PR is about, is about communicating the truth in effective ways. It's not about trying to communicate something that isn't true. And far too many PRs think it is about putting lipstick on a pig. And I, I, th I think in the end, all you can do is assume that your company will have the reputation it deserves and make sure the company has pitched its behavior at a level which, which will yield a reputation which it wants. No, and if, 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 if it's not, you know, I'm not saying there aren't going to be short-term bumps and distortions just as there are in your share price. But in the end, I would work on the assumption, because you can be really clever and you'll still get the PR wrong. And when you try too hard, it'll look like it's insincere and it'll look like it's insidious. So just be communicating the truth is what PR is about. And that, that's it. Yeah, I think I agree with that. But as you're an economist, I just want to ask the final question, which is your views on yesterday's uh, European <laughs> Commission ruling. Um, <laughs> I, I, I can see both sides of the argument, Peter. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think often people think... Um, but, but people often... I, I think the world probably feels more competitive to you than it might to some outsiders. And I, I mean, I think there's something in the argument. There is quite a lot of competition around and quite a lot of choice. And if there is, if there is competition, then I don't think it matters so much if you're favoring your own products, because we don't have to use your search engine. We can use someone else's. Um, and I think probably to you, it feels like there's a lot of competition between shopping services, potentially between search engines, between sites you can go to. And, and so I can see why, I can see why you might feel, I can see why you might feel aggrieved. Um, I'm not going to go further than that. <laughs> I'm not going to go further than that because I, I, as you know, if, if, you've heard, if you've heard anything in the last hour that sounds like an opinion, you've you've misunderstood me. <laughs> and um, but so I no, and then there there is there is this this argument is an old one. There's an economics of vertical restraints which is about people using their own suppliers. It's the same, it's the same by the way, as tied pubs. It's the same issue there. You know, brewers who own the pub and force the pub to take their beer, or should they have? This, this, this issue of so-called vertical restraints is an old issue. And in general, I think it's been seen as anti-competitive by half the economics comp profession who don't like any of these vertical ties. And the other half of the economics profession say, as long as there's competition for pubs, if this pub, if this brewer wants to lower the value of that pub by insisting that it has its rubbish beer in it, well, they'll make more money on the beer than they otherwise would, but they're making less money on the pub, and it doesn't, it doesn't matter. So there's a sort of huge economics, um, a huge economics of these vertical, th th these kind of privileging the in-house, privileging the in-house business. And the most important thing is that there's competition, really, at each side of the, of the deal. And that's where I think the argument would be. Great. Evan Davis, thank you very much indeed. Peter, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.